In the early 1060s, Fernando I of Leon was in a position unlike any previous Christian ruler in Spain since the Arab conquest of the 8th century. The emirs of the greatest Moorish cities in Al-Andalus were all eager to please him. The emir of Sevilla, Al-Mutadid, along with his substantial payment of annual tribute, even promised to give Fernando the relics of one of Christian Iberia's most ancient patrons, Saint Isidore. In 1063, Fernando sent Bishop Alvito of Leon and Count Muño Muñoz at the head of a company of knights to Sevilla, where the emir received them graciously. The Historia Silense says that, before turning the coffin containing the saint over to the Christians, al Mutadid threw a brocaded cloth over it and sighed, Now you are leaving here, revered Isidore. Well, you know how much your fame was mine. Fernando had the saint's body interred in a new church in Leon, built at the request of Queen Sancha. This church would be a mausoleum for the royal family. It was amid this triumphant atmosphere of the Leonese court that young Rodrigo Diaz, El Cid, came of age. During these years, Rodrigo received the belt of knighthood from Prince Sancho himself and began to distinguish himself in feats of arms. We hear of Rodrigo defeating a Navarrez knight called Jimeno Garces in single combat and slaying a Saracen warrior from Medina Kelly. But in 1063, Rodrigo would make his debut on a major campaign. In the spring of that year, Ramiro I, King of Aragon, attacked the lands of al Muqtadir, the Moorish ruler of Zaragoza. Lying to the north of the immense and wealthy Taifa of Zaragoza, the tiny and newly established Kingdom of Aragon was growing wealthier through the pilgrim traffic that passed through its main town of Aca. For some time now, King Ramiro had been eyeing the rich Zaragozan territories in the Ebro River Valley as natural grounds for expansion. However, Zaragoza paid tribute to King Fernando of Leon, and so when Ramiro attacked and conquered the town of Graus, al Muqtadir appealed to his Leonese overlord for help. Fernando was not at all comfortable with Ramiro's designs on Zaragoza. Not only did he extract a healthy tribute from the Moorish taifa, but he intended it for future Leonese expansion. Thus, the king charged his son, Sancho the Strong, with marching to Zaragoza's relief, assembling a Castilian force, which included Rodrigo Diaz. Prince Sancho marched on Graus in May of 1063. There, the Castilians did battle with the Aragonese, and King Ramiro himself was slain in the engagement. The Aragonese retreated, and Sancho, El Cid at his side, returned to his father's court in triumph. The sources provide little detail as to the course of the battle, but Rodrigo likely distinguished himself during the campaign, as his star was soon to rise considerably. The Battle of Graus reveals the complex politics of the era. A Castilian prince defeated the Christian Aragonese while defending the territory of a Muslim tributary. But such clashes were typical of the era, as up-and-coming Christian kingdoms competed with one another to dominate and extract tribute from the wealthy Muslim states. The annual tributes now paid by the four greatest Moorish kingdoms allowed Fernando to raise a larger army than ever. In 1064, the Leonese king launched the most ambitious campaign of his career. He sent an army to besiege Coimbra, a city that would become the center of the newly emerging county of Portugal. The Christians positioned battering rams all around Coimbra's walls. Fernando's campaigning the previous year had seriously undercut the ability of neighboring Moorish powers to respond. Finally, the defenders surrendered, and Coimbra passed into Fernando's possession. He now ruled some two-fifths of northern Portugal. His domain was expanded beyond anything his ancestors could have imagined. In 1065, Fernando invaded the Taifa of Valencia. After defeating Valencia's emir in the late autumn, he seemed on the verge of taking the city itself when he fell seriously ill. The old king quickly returned to Leon, where he began to prepare for death. That Christmas, he placed his crown and mantle on the altar of St. Isidore, 
commending himself to God. He died two days later, the first of Spain's great reconquering kings, whose reign was one of the most pivotal in Iberian history. Despite the glories of Fernando's reign, his final will would sow the seeds of discord. Disregarding the ancient traditions of Leon, Fernando divided his realm among his sons. To his eldest, Sancho, he gave Castile, while his second son, Alfonso, was to have Leon. Garcia, his youngest son, was to rule Galicia and the newly conquered region of Portugal. To his eldest child, his daughter Uraca, he gave the city of Zamora, and his daughter Elvira received Toro. Fernando, who was a proud father, desired that all of his children should have a fine inheritance. He insisted that his sons respect his will and live in peace with one another, for he knew well from his feuding with his own brothers how difficult it was for the sons of a king to share their inheritance. Although they agreed to abide by their father's wishes, ultimately Sancho, Alfonso, and Garcia would prove incapable of maintaining the brotherly love for one another their father had so desired to see in them. Not long after they'd interred their father and prayed at his tomb, they began a fierce civil war that would threaten to undermine all that their father had so tirelessly constructed. Now King of Castile, Sancho elevated his loyal follower, Rodrigo, to a most prestigious position, naming him Armager, commander of the royal armies. In essence, the Cid had been made right-hand man of the king. This was a highly honorable but also demanding position, putting Rodrigo in charge of recruiting, training, and keeping order among the king's warriors. Martial prowess alone was not enough to make a man successful in this role. He must also be a gifted administrator. He must have an expert's eye for appraising weapons and horses, and he must be capable of managing the payment of troops and the distribution of booty. He must be prepared to act as the king's chief military advisor, and he must be a first-class field commander. Undoubtedly, Rodrigo had shown outstanding abilities in a variety of areas to gain such an appointment. Some historians believe that it was during this period that Rodrigo gained his first nickname, the one by which he was known before he was called El Cid, Campeador. Dating back to the late Roman era, the title essentially translates to Teacher of the Battlefield. In a Roman army of the 4th or 5th century, the term was used to describe a regimental drill instructor. The aging Queen Sancha strongly desired to see peace maintained among her sons, and while she lived, her children respected her wishes. But in 1067, the widowed queen finally died, and civil war broke out almost at once among the late Fernando's heirs. Sancho was the first to open hostilities against his brothers. In 1071, he deprived his brother Garcia of Galicia, forcing him to flee south to Coimbra, where he was able to hold out for the time being. The following year, Sancho, his knight El Cid at his side, invaded Leon, still under the control of his brother Alfonso. The Castilian and Leonese forces clashed at the Battle of Golpera. Rodrigo bore his king's standard and distinguished himself in the fighting. As usual, Sancho was victorious, taking Alfonso prisoner and having himself crowned King of Leon on the 12th of January. Sancho now marched into Portugal. Garcia fled to the Moors, taking refuge with the Emir of Sevilla. Sancho exiled Alfonso into Moorish territory as well. Alfonso took shelter with Al Mamun of Toledo. Thus, in 1072, the eldest son of Fernando I appeared to have utterly subdued his brothers, making himself master of the whole of his father's realm. However, there was unrest in Sancho's lands, with some factions of the clergy and nobility unwilling to accept his usurpation of Fernando I's will. The Bishop of Leon had outright refused to crown Sancho, and his elder sister, Uraca would not recognize his claim to Alfonso's inheritance. With her knights, Uraca withdrew to her fortress of Zamora, from which she could easily communicate with Alfonso in Toledo. Believing his sister colluded with their younger brother, Sancho, with El Cid by his side, marched south to besiege Zamora. 
Here, too, Rodrigo fought well for his king, but over the course of the operations, an unknown killer assassinated Sancho before the walls of the fortress on October 6, 1072. All at once, everything changed. Alfonso now returned in triumph to reclaim Leon, and Castile as well, since Sancho had died childless. Undeniably, Alfonso benefited greatly from the sudden death of his brother. This likely aroused much suspicion at the time, especially in Rodrigo and other members of Sancho's inner circle. Had Alfonso been behind the killing of his older brother? Had he ordered the assassination or been involved in some less direct manner? At the time, no one could conclusively link Alfonso to Sancho's death, and the same remains true to this day. The identity of Sancho's assassin is unknown to historians, and we are left to speculate as to who the killer might have been and what might have been his motives. Although Alfonso gained much by his brother's demise, that fact alone does not prove guilt. But the cloud of suspicion around Alfonso has never and probably will never be dispelled. Questions have also long been raised as to the involvement of Princess Uraka, but the truth is we are equally unable to link her to the crime. Because Alfonso and Uraka often acted together, the princess has long been accused of hatching a plot with Alfonso. Over time, this scenario has developed right along with the legend of El Cid himself. By the 13th century, the poets sang of Rodrigo publicly demanding that Alfonso swear on the Gospels that he was innocent of Sancho's death. This famous and powerful scene is one of the most memorable and recognizable images of El Cid, the loyal knight demanding justice for his fallen master. Despite the appeal of the story, it is entirely absent from our earliest source material and has all the signs of later legend. Indeed, our chief source for the life of El Cid, the Historia Roderici, doesn't even raise suspicion that Alfonso could have had anything to do with Sancho's slaying. One can only speculate as to the emotions felt by young Rodrigo after this shocking course of events. Rodrigo had grown up alongside Sancho, and he'd been entirely loyal to him. Now. Sancho was dead, and the man who'd come to power in his place was under a cloud of suspicion. Perhaps Rodrigo, as Sancho's right-hand man, could have expected no place in Alfonso's new administration. And yet, the Historia Roderici says the following, After the death of Rodrigo's Lord King Sancho, who had maintained him and loved him well, King Alfonso received him with honor as his vassal, and kept him in his entourage with very respectful affection. In fact, Rodrigo seems to have transitioned easily into the service of King Alfonso. Perhaps Rodrigo did harbor suspicions, but he was in no position to refuse his service to the new man on the throne. Alfonso, for his part, had no interest in alienating the knights that had followed his brother. He needed to foster harmony between Leon and Castile, so that he could successfully rule both. But although Rodrigo earned a place among Alfonso's military entourage, he could not expect to retain the post of Armiger. Alfonso reserved such high honors for his own inner circle, and certainly would not have put one of his brother's leading companions into such a commanding office. Sancho was buried in accordance with his wishes, at the monastery of Oña in Castile. Rodrigo was surely among the men who accompanied the fallen king's body to its final resting place. The new monarch was crowned Alfonso VI, King of Leon Castile. He was destined to be one of Spain's most celebrated rulers. With Sancho dead, Garcia thought himself safe to return to Portugal. He was invited by Alfonso and Uraca to a conference in 1073. When Garcia arrived, his elder siblings had him captured and confined to the castle of Luna in northern Leon. At this point, Fernando I's middle son, Alfonso VI, moved quickly to restore the hegemonic supremacy of Leon Castilla, as had existed on the death of his father. Both the nobility and the clergy embraced the new king. Zaragoza offered tribute to the new king, 
and by 1074, Alfonso VI had already reclaimed the tributary status of Al Mamun, the Emir of Toledo. That summer, Alfonso, accompanied by troops from the Taifa of Toledo, launched a massive campaign against Moorish Granada, which was also made a tributary to Leon. <laughs> 